Hello, uh, my name is Terry Waluvengo. I'll be taking you, today we are going to be learning legal research. It is uh, a DLO unit, DLO 1112, and uh, taken at uh, the Parklands Law School, where uh, we prepare lawyers for their work in future. This being the fifth topic in the syllabus, there are presumptions that we are going to make concerning what you have already learned. It is going to be founded on what has already been covered, but it is important for, for, for us to understand that it is very core. Research is very core to the entire study of uh, the study of law. It requires an understanding of how to carry out research because essentially the work of an advocate, the work of a legal profession is concerned with finding the law. It is impossible for you to master all the acts of parliament, but you will be taught how to find the law. A lawyer, a good lawyer, is one who can know where the law is and therefore take it uh, very seriously because this will, you, you will need the skills that you will learn in legal research to tackle other units. You will learn how to tackle other units, how to answer questions in other units. So this is very, very critical to your, uh, to your studies and therefore I, I hope that we will all concentrate and follow through to the end. As opposed to any other kinds of research, the research that we do in law is supposed to assist in making decisions, in decision making. Which decisions are these that we are referring to? In court, where justice happens, we require that whoever is listening to a case will have information on what is the law, how the law is going to be applied. It is possible for us to say that in fact we do not really have a definition, a settled definition of what legal research is. But based on scholars of law, we can see that we have come to the conclusion that it has something to do with finding information, searching. From the word research, we have, you can see the word search searching for, looking for information, looking for, uh, for, for the truth. And therefore, you are looking for something that is already there, meaning you are retrieving. Someone got it. Right now, we are in a library setting. Books contain information that was already documented. When you are researching, you go back to this documentation and retrieve, get it for a particular purpose. And that is why I have concluded by saying that the definition that we will move with as we continue from the onset, understand that legal research is defined as the process of identifying and retrieving information necessary to support legal decision making. With that sentence, you have said a lot concerning what really the subject is all about. In its broad sense, legal, res legal research includes each step of a course of action that begins with an analysis of the facts of a problem and concludes with the application and communication of the research, of, of the investigation. So we already mentioned in the beginning that the research itself is a process. Research is a process, meaning it has a beginning and an end. And we are saying that the beginning is the collection of relevant information. You can't go on a wild chase when you are doing research. You must know what you are looking for. You must know exactly what you are going for. You have to narrow down to a specific thing. Otherwise, it may be an enormous task to research on a variety of things at the same time because usually you have time limitations within which you need to complete a particular research. In our court uh, situation, for example, we have, uh, you know, timelines. You have a date set for hearing, a date set for submissions, and therefore you don't have all uh, uh, the time <coughs> in the world, and therefore things have to be done within a specified 
time period. So you have the beginning, the middle, and then the end. So we can say that we have those three uh, uh, stages. And the very last one, as we said, is about communicating. Another word that is used for communication of results is dissemination. And in fact, the correct word, terminology, when it comes to the subject of research, is not communicating the information, it is dissemination of the information. So remember, you must always have an audience. Later, we'll be seeing who are you researching for, because you can't just research for the sake of it. There must be a purpose. You will find out what you are researching about, who stands to benefit from it, who are your audience. The audience will really determine uh, how you proceed in your research, even the language that you use, its content, and so on. And that is very easy to understand. You can imagine if you are, uh, uh, your audience is children, <clears throat> you will completely change how you communicate so that they can easily understand. If you're communicating to persons who perhaps have not uh, had the benefit to enjoy formal learning, then you have to be as, for, uh, as informal as possible for them to <clears throat> understand the content. So dissemination is usually the very last uh, part of research. And um, <clears throat> we had mentioned that, in fact, we have many words that, refer, that we use to, to, to refer to the process of research. You'll find in some books it being referred to as a, a study or a project. And also from our, from our definition, you can see it being referred to as an investigation. Essentially, it is a search for the truth, searching for information. And we'll see why it is very important to be very keen while doing research. Okay? Because it is possible for you to come across information which is untrue. Okay? The fact that someone has written a book does not mean that they mean well or they have put in their truthful information. It is upon you, the legal student, to refer to the right content, the right material. You have to be clear on what you are uh, researching about. So it is impossible to understand or start a research, uh, understand legal research before we know where it comes from. As the legal researcher, where are you going to search? We have uh, the, the main sources of law, which I believe we have all come across, the sources of law that are recognized in Kenya and in the Kenya justice system, the legal system, include the constitution. And the constitution is the supreme law of the land, meaning that if any other law is inconsistent with the Constitution, then what happens is that the Constitution will prevail, meaning to the extent of the, of the inconsistency, the other law will not have a chance in court or where, anywhere else. So the Constitution legislation, when we say legislation, we mean the Act of Parliament. This is a 1.1 1 .1, uh, unit, and therefore it is understandable that my audience today has no uh, background or have not studied um, um, any law at all. And therefore I'll go into details as I explain the very, very basics of uh, these sources. So legislations are Acts of Parliament. Another name for them is statutes. These are the laws that are made in Parliament by our lawmakers. And then another source that is ex accepted or uh, recognized is uh, delegated legislation. What we mean by delegated leg legislation is that they, we have bodies. We have bodies other than Parliament. Yes, we elect members of Parliament during election. And because our, our government is representative, we allow this one person that we have elected in a constituency, for example, to represent our will, our wishes, our aspirations. We place them in the hands of one person. And when they go to Parliament, they do not talk on their own behalf. They talk on our behalf. And because we elected them, we believe they have our, their best interest at heart. But then you come and find that there are other people that have not been elected. We ne never elected them. But then they have some responsibility of ma also making 
laws. How is this possible? It is possible because when you look at how parliament works, you find that it is sometimes difficult for them to make certain laws, to enforce certain provisions of the law, and therefore it becomes necessary for the parliament to empower, give, delegate their power to another body to make certain laws. Among the, the, the reasons that uh, come to mind is, for example, the technicality. You realize that for people to go to parliament, it's only recently that uh, there was a requirement for for, 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 for members of parliament to have at least a degree in a particular field. But the reality is that there are certain things which require such a level of technicality that may be lacking in parliament. Okay? So you look at something like uh, the work that is done by the National Environmental Management Program, NEMA, and they, they, they take care of our environment. It is, uh, uh, you know, they, they require scientific backing and a deep understanding of how the environment works. And, and therefore, that may be lacking in Parliament. We may not have specialists, okay, experts in a particular area. And because of that, uh, uh, you know, Parliament delegates. If you look at, at, um, if you look at how uh, the calendar of Parliament op uh, is, is uh, formulated, it is such that there are periods within the year or within their term, that they don't really, uh, they, are not in, 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 they are not in session. But while they are not in session, decisions need to be made. Things have to continue running. So it would, make, it would, it would not be possible for us to have, um, you know, a running government without, uh, when parliamentarians are not in session. So because of this, many, many, and many other reasons which we learn in other units, such as... Uh, you know, the introductory units, you learn more about why we have delegated legislations and the limits that are there. And uh, for, for our purposes, we just need to understand that delegated legislation is a source of law and those who have been given power, who have been delegated to some power to make laws, actually make valid laws. Those laws are not any less than, for example, statutory no. But when we now come to the, to, to, to the hierarchy, we say that the law that is made by that delegated body must be in line with statutory. Just the way we say all other laws must be compliant with the Constitution. You should not have a situation where a law has provisions which are not consistent with the Constitution. If it happens, then the Constitution prevails. The same way, these delegated legislations are a result of a, an, an a, a, a apparent act. We say we have apparent act. Okay? Like, for example, we are students here. There is the Education Act, which takes care of all issues to do with education, but then we narrow down and say we also have University Act, we have a university charter that allows the, the, the university to run and makes provision of how they are going to do their, 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 their management. So this delegated legislation must be in line with the parent act which is empowered, which creates them and empowers them and it should follow the guidelines. Otherwise, whatever they do under administrative law, if they, it's beyond the powers that they were given, we say that they are acting ultra virus. So another source of law that you will use uh, as you carry out legal research is common law. Kenya is a member of the common law jurisdiction. By virtue of the fact that we were colonized by Britain, we inherited this system after independence and we have carried on with it. And therefore, common law applies to us and can be a source. Equity is another source of law that is recognized in Kenya and you can apply uh, principles of equity, which are several principles that we learn about as you submit your, as you, ca as you go on with your research. We have customary law. Customary law is a very, very important source of law that uh, we, recognizes our way of life as, 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 a, as a people, as inhabitants of this part of the world, as Africans. We had our methods of resolving disputes before colonization happened, and therefore uh, this has gotten uh, room within our laws. And there, so in certain areas, and it's very restricted, we only apply customary law 
in private law matters. When you say private law matters, it means that uh, uh, administrative issues, you know, we cannot apply African customary law on public, I, I mean, in, in public law, public life issues such as, uh, you know, if someone commits a crime, you cannot say that let us apply customary law to punish him. That will be a public law issue and therefore the uh, customary law, African customary law cannot apply to it. And so um, it, it, we have a quite a limited application uh, for customary law to only apply when, so for example, when you are, you, are, you are researching on an issue to do with inheritance, then you can apply African customary law. If you are researching on an issue to do with, um, uh, you know, private life, issues of children's custody, uh, divorce, you know, marriage and its requirements, all those recognize African customary law and therefore you can quote provisions or how other certain communities do their thing. But for now, if you're, if you're for example, researching on a, a subject to do with commercial law, business law, how to solve dis business disputes, you cannot quote African customary law. Okay? So that is how restrictive it is. So having said this, we move on to ask ourselves as law students, why must we study legal research? Is it necessary? Why is it important? Once we attach a level of importance to this study, it will be easier for us to know that it is critical for us to master the content of legal research. Now, it is important to understand that law actually regulates societies. Law is a regulator. One person said that, uh, you know, we have a formula which says society minus law is equals to chaos. Meaning we cannot have a, run, a smoothly running uh, a progressive society if we do not have laws. But remember this society that is being regulated by law so that people don't do as they wish, don't interfere with other people's rights. Yeah, that society is not static. When you say a society is not static, it doesn't, it is, it means the opposite. That the society is dynamic. It keeps changing. Okay? So if the society keeps changing, things which were acceptable, uh, were not acceptable in the past, today they are acceptable. Certain expectations are now available which before were not there. So because we keep changing every day, and we can, they, they, you know, we, we, this change cannot be stopped by anything. It keeps happening. You can see today we are learning online, okay, because of technology and the availability of, uh, uh, um, yeah, the technology can has enabled us. Before, we could not do this. And therefore, then we need legislation to govern how technology is going to be used so that it cannot be abused, it cannot be used to affect other people, negatively. So having understood that societies keep changing, we also need now to recognize and appreciate that the law also must change. And for sure, the law has kept changing and it continues to change every day. When I say every day, you need to believe me because every day we go to court to get decisions and there is judgment law. Case law is a source of law made in court. So decisions can be made which will affect our lives and um, when those decisions are made, they can be uh, changed. So the law is an ever-changing entity. Local and national legislatures continually create new laws or amend, amend uh, old laws. The, law, the laws are also continually interpreted by court. So you understand that the parliament continues to be a body we have three, uh, the three arms of government, the three arms of government. Law students should understand those three very well because they all have something to do with the law. They all have something to do with the law. We have the cabinets and the presidency. Then we have legislature, which is the lawmaker, and we have 
judiciary. So legislature will make the laws and we will have um, parliament is a lawmaker. Then you have uh, cabinet and this, uh, many, the ministries under it doing the enforcement, enforcing provisions, uh, not enforcing but implementing. So they implement what the law says and then we have the enforcer being the courts, decisions that are made in court concern enforcement. So, the, uh, uh, yeah, so we have those three. When you look at why we do research, is, it is to also inform, uh, appreciate these changes and make, uh, make them available. Okay. Remember, we talked about dissemination. The public needs to know. How will they know if we don't bring it to their attention? So when you're carrying out uh, research of any kind, these three questions are very important for you to consider because they are going to guide you. A researcher must know what they want to tell people. What is it that you want to research about? You must identify a problem, an issue of interest, which would be of interest to, to, to uh, your audience. Remember what I said about your audience, that you need to know who you are researching for. If you are researching for legal purposes, you, as a researcher, for example, let's take you yourselves as students, when you research as part of your academic journey, it means that your audience is your supervisor of your lecturer, I mean supervisor of your, of your research, who is usually your uh, lecturer. So what do you want to tell? You have to identify the area of law which you feel requires redress, requires maybe a change. You have identified a problem. It can be a very simple problem, for example, of uh, definition. In our Kenyan laws, we are saying a child, let's we take example of children's law. A child is a person below the age of 18. And then we have the rights of a child, the duties of parents towards their children, which include, for example, disciplining of the children. Okay? So you have a provision under the Constitution that protects children, and we have provisions of the Children's Act which say protect the child, make provisions for these children, prepare them for the future by giving them an education, do not harm them, okay? So, you, for example, in, in our country, uh, uh, for the few past few years, we no longer allow corporal punishment of children uh, in school. Okay? But then you may have a question. How far can uh, a parent go? Is it possible for a parent to overstep his right as a parent when disciplining a child? Yes, it is. We have seen cases, even in the media, of parents who have completely uh, uh, abused their children in, in the name of discipline. So where do you draw the line? When do you say, now it is too much? Now it has become a, a criminal offense, okay? So still on the issue of children, when you say persons below the age of 18 cannot vote because they are children, is that right? So you can see that, in, uh, you know, research has to do with inquiries, making, questioning the, 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 the status of things is part of what we do in research. And we influence policy in that way. So you can say, why should you say a person below the age of 18 cannot vote? Is it true that when you are below the age of 18, you don't know what's happening? The answer is no. Can it be possible that in future we can try to reduce this age maybe to 15? Because if you look at the, 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 the reason why people vote is to, 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 to determine you know, how we are going to be governed. And we have a very huge... Uh, 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 youthful population and to allow them you know we can give the pros and cons is it good to reduce this age for, 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 for people so that we allow younger people to vote knowing that these leaders are going to affect their lives tremendously as compared to the older generation does it make sense to allow an 80 year old person to vote but not a 17 year old person to vote so that's a, a, a possible legal question. Basically what I'm saying is that our laws are not cast on stone. It doesn't mean that it, if it's written, it is written like that, like the Ten Commandments, which will never change. Our laws can always change. But how will they change? We have to get informed changes. The policymakers need to be alerted that there is a loophole. 
there is a problem. We need to change positively by incorporating a particular thing, and that can only happen through research. And in fact, because of how deeply research impacts on our lives, you will find that our allocation, like for example in our country, the biggest chunk of the money allocated for education goes to research, and for a very good reason. Right now, the, the world is grappling with a pandemic. Okay? Who will sort us from this pandemic? It is researchers in the laboratories. They are busy looking for a vaccine. That is how important uh, research is. So you need to know what you want to tell. Who do you want to tell? Who does it concern? Because by knowing who it concerns, you will have the information of who to question, for example, who will be your stakeholders, who can finance your research, research is not cheap. Do not imagine you can go and do research uh, without money. We require funding to carry out proper research. And then how do you tell? How do you present whatever you have discovered? How do you tell that truth that you have discovered when carrying out research? So at a later uh, date, we will learn about research writing, how to present material, but not, uh, not today. For today, we just need to understand basically what legal research is, what is done in legal research, the importance, why is it important, what purpose that is, that does it serve, and then uh, we can grow from there. Because it's necessary for me to mention again that research is actually a discipline. We have lawyers who just specialize and become legal researchers. They don't do anything else, they don't go to court, they, 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 they don't, you know, they just, they are legal uh, researchers. So it is a discipline. When I say a discipline, it means it's a whole study that someone will specialize and go possibly up to the PhD level to become a legal researcher. And that is why we will not say everything today. You are doing the very basic foundations of what research is and how necessary it is for a legal practitioner. Now, purposes of legal research. So far, we have mentioned, um, we have mentioned several uh, reasons why we carry out research, mainly because we have uh, the fact that our society is ever-changing. And we never, it is not possible to have uh, uh, a society that is static. That has never, all societies in the, in the world have experienced change over time. When it comes now to, to, to the area uh, of law, the relevance is even more important. Because as you can see, uh, we say even though an area of law might seem settled, a small nuance in a particular set of facts can create an entirely new subtopic or sub-area. So when we say settled law, it means that there's an understanding or consensus that that law is okay. Yeah? L like for example, when we say um, it is law that killing someone is wrong, there's no day we will say that killing is okay. That it is settled, that it is wrong to take a person's life without proper, uh, without the, the uh, reasons such as self-defense and, uh, you know, other reasons. So point two, basically, it's uh, expounding on the fact that there are areas within settled law which are still problematic. And uh, perhaps if we can make reference to... To, to, to our environment and what is happening. Currently, there's a bill before Parliament concerning the reproductive health rights of teenagers. We have a problem in our hands as a society that we have very many teenage pregnancies and we are looking for a solution. What can we do? Can we make changes to the law to allow certain and non-conventional ways of handling this problem. For example, can you give contraception to children in class seven? Okay, so we have very, uh, 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 you know, uh, problematic situations which have competing interests. So that you'll have one side of the population saying that is very wrong. You cannot be encouraging our children to do this. But on the other hand, 
we have another uh, um, category of people who are saying, then give us another solution. What can we do? There is a problem. You cannot bury your heads in the sand anymore. This is a problem that requires a legal solution. So we cannot completely have areas which are, uh, are, are settled and they, you know, they, they, they are not problematic. In every area of law, right now as we speak, all the types of laws that we have and they are around 30, all of them have controversial issues around them. All the areas of law have controversial issues around them. When I say that, we can, for example, take the issue of um, um, human rights. What limitations are there? Can people just trample on other people's uh, rights? And the answer is no. Can the state interfere with your rights? We have seen recently that uh, you know curfews are just announced and you are told you can't move after 7 o'clock. What right is the state using? Can we question that right? Okay. And then um, remember, as lawmaking goes on, there are three things that happen. So, judicial, I mean, uh, uh, parliament has a duty to make changes to the law. They can make, make new laws, uh, amend existing laws, or completely banish from the face of the, of our, uh, of the, of the law a particular legislation. It is actually possible for, for a law to become obsolete. Okay? Uh, for example, we can use, uh, during the colonial period, we had an act which was to regulate movement and how, how natives behave. It was a natives act and it made provision for something called a hat tax. A hat tax is money that was supposed to be paid by uh, our grandfathers, the colonized persons. But this is no longer operational. We now have an, an agency known as CARE, has a duty of collecting tax, and therefore the provisions of that natives act are no longer applicable. They are not necessary at all. And therefore, you completely repeal, remove that law from our body of laws. And that can only happen when it is pointed out through research that this particular act is useless, remove it. This particular act requires changes. Please change this and this within the act. So you can see that forms an important part of uh, legal research to facilitate changes which will allow for um, the law to be better and to serve the purposes of the public at any given time. Now, importance of legal research. We have five uh, main ones. Importance of legal research. Why is legal research important? Number A, first of all, it helps us with discovery. It is important for us to understand that purpose, discovery. Research is all about discovery, to find a truth, to search for the truth. Through research, the law student or the lawyer discovers new arguments. Okay. When we say new arguments, those are just... Um, new perspectives of ways or ways of viewing a particular thing. Research also helps us with clarification. Good research helps, with, uh, helps the researcher to clarify their ideas on issues pertinent to their work. Clarity is very, very important. You will find that our laws can be sometimes quite vague that a law, and it's for good reason, it is not by mistake that you find laws not being very clear. And, uh, and therefore, uh, through research, you can really uh, find out what exactly was meant by the legislator when uh, they were drafting, what was the expectation. So you clarify by seeking more information, by analyzing uh, provisions of the law. A simple question, like, uh, who is a pedestrian? Very simple question. Who is a pedestrian? When you say pedestrian, what comes to your mind? It is someone walking on the road. But then, so an act of parliament like the Traffic Act can simply say pedestrians should be, I mean, uh, drivers of vehicles should be mindful of pedestrians on the road. Ensure that you don't knock people as you, as, as, uh, as you use your vehicle. 
So just the word pedestrian can be analyzed further so that we can ask ourselves, are animals also pedestrians? Because you can find animals grazing near the road, crossing the road. In fact, in, in our country, our animals are very good. You will find cows crossing the road without even any someone you know, assisting them because that's, you know. So um, does that pass? As, as a, what about a person who is being wheeled on a wheelchair? Is that a pedestrian and what duties are there when it comes to use of the road? So the, all these issues uh, can be analyzed and clarified by proper application of research. Another, important, um, another importance of legal research is advancement. Advancement. Effective research contributes to the general advancement of knowledge, understanding, and process. So advancement is development, making things better. Because of research, because of discoveries that have been made during research, it is possible for us to say we have made great advancements from, as a human family, for example, from the different ages that we have gone through, Remember your history, lawyers should have their history at hand. Human history, we started from Stone Age, moved, or we, let's say we advanced to agrarian, where we could, uh, we, we could uh, 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 plant you know, crops and have uh, uh, secure, you know, we have security or secure food production because it was necessary. And then we advanced and then we had the agrarian, I mean, uh, from agrarian age, we went uh, where people could work and uh, it was possible for people to, 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 to work in industries, uh, industrial age. And we have moved and now we are at uh, a, a very advanced age known as the digital age. So you can see all these things happened because someone did something. Someone saw a, a vision, someone had a vision and could see that we can be better. Even as we are now, we are not yet done. We can still be more. We can be better in many different ways. So research allows us to advance. And that's why as we continue, you'll see that we, are, we keep referring to the fact of new knowledge. You must be able to add to the body of knowledge that we have. We have something called state of the art. State of the art means at this point in time, this is where we are. If you say state of the art vehicle, that's a vehicle which can do things which last year, a vehicle that was manufactured last year could not do. Things have been done to it to enable it do certain special, um, uh, to have certain abilities. Usually that terminology is used by engineers on, and, and uh, uh, creators, designers, that you come to a level which, you know, at that point that is the best state of the art. But then we are saying that state of the art is not static. It doesn't remain like that. There's always advancement. If you want to, see, to know that advancement happens, look at our phones, smartphones, how they have advanced from what it was to where we are now, that the phone can be used for so many things. And the, the, the new one takes very few months and you can see a better one has come into the market because research is going on. So research is good because it, advan it of advancement makes things better, keeps improving on what we already have. And therefore, as a researcher, as you carry out your research, as you read, as you inform, you, you are supposed to ensure that you are not re you know, reproducing other people's work. Later, we learn about plagiarism and how to make reference to a uh, material that, uh, that, that you use as a researcher. You should use other people's work, but in the end, give us something fresh. Make an addition to what we have. Show us something new. And then we have authentication. authentication. You should always remember this word. It's very, very important in law. Authenticity. It comes from the word authenticity. To authenticize is to confirm truthfulness. Usually this word, you'll find it in the law of evidence. When we come to court, we bring uh, our evidence, but it has to be authenticated. It has to be clear that it is truthful. Authenticity has to be to do with truth because we have scammers in the world. Okay? When can we say this is, you know, we have to differentiate truth and falsehoods. 
So even within research, we have some false information. If there's a time in the human history where we have witnessed uh, falsehoods, it's actually during this digital, digital age. We all know about false news. That you see something online, <coughs> it's very convincing. Someone has written a story, sometimes even accompanied by a photo, but it's actually not true. It can, be no, it can uh, fail to be truthful with regard to the time when it happened. Okay? We have seen photos from uh, uh, different countries, and someone claims that is in, in Machakos County. But it's not even in Kenya. So that is false information. And people have different agendas for giving false information. You will find uh, uh, in the literary world, we have what is called fiction. Fiction is a genre of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of uh, literature. It is okay. When you say fiction, it means someone has made it up. It's not reality. So even as you read, you know these things never happened. Okay? They happened in the mind of the writer. And they do it for uh, a very good reason. You read fictional pieces or watch fictional uh, programs to relax your mind, to learn, or to, you know, to, to expand your imagination because they are not reality. Yeah? So in research, we deal with reality. So because of that, you will never be asked, I mean, you are not expected to make reference to fictional material. You cannot say in a novel written by John Grisham, I saw, they said ABCD. You cannot, because that is fictional writing. We expect you to refer to formal material, which is realistic, actual happenings, actual references of things as they are. If you are making reference to uh, Supreme Court, it has to be the real Supreme Court that is in existence. If you are saying, powers of the judges in the Supreme Court, they must be as provided for in the Constitution. So the Constitution is formal. The books that you'll find in the law library are formal, not uh, fiction. I do not mean that you should not read fiction. It's very good for, your, for developing your vocabulary, making your English better. It's very, very important. But then you cannot refer to this material when you're carrying out your research. So when you talk of authentication, we say research is important for the purpose of authenticating the thoughts, ideas, and presentations of the researcher. You cannot just drop a sentence or drop a claim. We cannot just say uh, COVID is spread in the air without backup. So authentication has to do with backup evidence okay so um, when you do research you give uh, information and you back it up you say this is because so you can have seriously com com competing uh, discussion eh? competing when I say competing uh, discussion it means controversial yeah it's a better term controversial issue we have controversial issues that have different views about them. Uh, we can, for example, use uh, the death penalty. The de death penalty is a controversial issue. Why? Particularly in our country. Uh, when we use it, it is actually a punishment. Death penalty is a punishment that is meted on persons who have committed any of the three capital offenses, murder, uh, robbery, violence, or they have attempted to overturn the government, okay? But we have a controversial issue in our hands. There are countries in the world which have abolished the death penalty. They have said this is not a proper punishment. We cannot commit the very sin which we are trying to instigate and say it is wrong. If, taking li if life is so precious, then even the life of the person who has committed murder is precious. That is the argument, that this is a very bad punishment. And I can assure you, I can tell you, in Africa, we never had the death penalty. Okay? People committed offenses, but none of the African communities allowed for someone's life to just be taken because they have committed an offense. You could be sent away. You can be told, now you are banished from this society, find somewhere else to go, but not taking life. So this came with the Muzungu coming to our country, but it had its own proponents. There are people who support and say, if you cannot respect another person's life, then even your life cannot be respected. Your life won't be respected also. That is the punishment that is in the law. Okay? 
So those are competing interests. But we are saying any time you front an argument, have reasons which will back you up and they should be waterproof. There should be reasons which are convincing. If your stand is that life is precious, it means that you are pro, you are against the death penalty. You have to tell us why. And you can't just say it is bad. That is not proper uh, support. We need good reasoning of why you are saying it is bad. For example, you can say um, when you punish this one person, you are punishing other people. You are punishing his children. You are punishing his, his, uh, his, his mother, his parents. Yet those people are innocent. When you take, intentionally take uh, life, you can also argue and say this punishment cannot be reversed. Other punishment you can reverse. If you take someone to, for, to pre prison and then you find uh, that they were actually innocent, you can remove them from prison. If you make someone pay a fine and later you find that, oh, there was a mistake in the trial, this person is actually innocent, they can be given back their money. But what will you do if you find that a person who has been killed was actually innocent? It's too late. Too late in the day to do anything. Okay? So... What, that's what we mean we, by authentication when it comes to research, that we find the truth. What is the truth? Because we have a lot of falsehoods, okay? And falsehoods are even more than the truth. Liars are more than the people who tell us the truth. So can we be able to see, using research and the methods that we use in research, including those in the scientific world where you use a laboratory, today we have DNA technology, for example. It is 100% correct. Once you find DNA of a person matching, then there's no way of saying these people are not related. It is 100%. It is scientific. And therefore, it is authentic. And so research enables us to sieve and remain with the truth. Get rid of the falsehoods and retain the truth. We have facts which have been overruled over time because of research. For a long time, we believed that the world is actually round. But later, we found that it is not round. It's a different shape. Okay? We even thought it was flat. Okay? So that was, by that time, it was the truth. But for sure, we have some truths which are clothed like, some falsehoods which have a dress of truth. Research will help us to undress that falsehood and find out what truly is the case. Now, we have types of research. We'll classify these types of research. Um, when we talk of types of research in legal research, broadly, we categorize uh, legal research. And research generally, all the kinds of research that we will do, that we have learned about, are categorized into qualitative or quantitative. When you say qualitative, you can see the word quality there. Okay, It is to do with how a particular thing is. And uh, the opposite is quantitative. Quantitative, you can see the word quantity there. It has to do with numbers, <coughs> Numeric, no, numerical. That, for example, the census, counting people. That is quantitative. It tells us this is the number of people. Okay? If you carry out research, how many students do we have in MKU? We will be given a number that will be a quantitative uh, research. How many graduates of MKU get employment? You are looking at a number that is quantitative research. Why do MKU graduates get jobs very quickly? That one now will become qualitative. We are asking certain questions which answers are not have nothing to do with numbers. Qualitative. <clears throat> now, <coughs> it's important for me to notify you <coughs> Excuse me. To, to, to notify you that um, we mostly, in legal research, we rely on qualitative research more than quantitative. You may refer to quantitative very few, uh, you know, not much. Eh? Our, our kind of research does not, is not about numeracy or, uh, or numbers. We are more concerned with how the law is in a particular, pre, uh, particular place, and that is what we call doctrinal. When you say doctrinal research, it is asking the question, what is the law in a particular place? What laws apply to Kenya? What laws apply to a particular county, and how does it apply? Is it accepted? Is that law accepted as law? 
if today we say now you know uh, uh, there's a group of our, of our people uh, of our population which are seeking to to legalize uh, gay marriages for example okay there's actually an organization yeah but what is the feeling of kenyans concerning this issue if you go into that study what you are doing is doctrinal uh doctrinal research and we say qualitative research can only be non-doctrinal it can only be non-doctrinal it doesn't ask what is the law how does the law apply how can the law be changed it doesn't ask you uh, those questions so we have those two categorizations we'll be looking at um, more about this but for the basics you have to understand some of these terminologies know what is doctrinal uh, empirical research where you go one-on-one -on -one and you're asking a particular person a respondent and they're giving you answers you use those answers you analyze these answers and come to a conclusion that conclusion will tell you the status of the law the changes that needs to be done on the law policy and so on we also have uh, when you look at sources of law we also classify them into two there's primary sources and we have secondary sources primary sources are the contents of the law what the law is and then when you talk of secondary those are the analysts who tell us more about how the law is so you can for example take between the constitution and a book which tries to analyze something to do with maybe human rights the book is a secondary source and the constitution is a primary source because the primary sources contain the law itself the substantive law okay evidence act is the substantive law of evidence yeah but in the opposite we have other sources that we use what you are seeing around me these books are secondary sources very very critically important to a legal researcher this is an explanation of doctrinal legal research or theoretical legal research can be defined as in simple terms as research which asks, which asks what the law is in a particular area it's very important to explain that uh, there's a very key difference that you need to master difference between uh, primary and secondary the primary sources cannot be challenged at least in court you cannot challenge uh, provisions of the constitution for example provisions of a statute you cannot challenge that they are binding the court is expected to follow provisions of uh, primary sources but we use secondary sources as a way of we use secondary sources to convince or you know uh, further explain what is provided for or uh, what 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 is provided for in the primary sources so the, the whatever you find in secondary sources you will only use it for persuasion persuasive it it should enable you persuade a, a, a court on some things like uh, interpretation, but not the real content. That marks the end of our class today. I hope that you have enjoyed. I welcome you again for another session. Thank you very much. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then, email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.